This is the Jerry Doyle Show. As promised, joining us from the ground campaign in Iowa, 12-term Texas Congressman, Republican Ron Paul, presidential Republican nominee, leading in the poll of polls at Real Clear Politics. Congressman Paul, good to talk with you again. Thank you. Nice to be with you today. Uh, no, I, and the thank yous, we were just talking about this before you came on. When I endorsed your uh, your campaign on Tuesday, we, I don't know if you know we did, but we, we have the sixth largest show in the country. And... The Ronulans, as they call themselves, flooded my inbox uh, with the thank yous. You're brave. You're a patriot. You know all that kind of stuff. And I was like, No, you you don't get it. Um, what I want to thank you for is is being consistent and and giving me somebody that I can look at who has been consistent over time and has has given me what I think is necessary to get behind the tools necessary to beat the consistent, what I call socialist, Barack Obama. So my thanks go to you for, if anything, being consistent. Well, thank, thank you very much. And I think, really, the country is being starved for something like that and, and to be able to get straight answers. And there will be people that will come up and they'll say that, you know, I like what you say. I don't agree with everything. But, boy, at least you're consistent. You stick to your guns and I can trust you. And it seems like that carries a person through a lot. So I deeply appreciate your support. And when you look at what you've said over the past, what you've done over the past, what you've predicted in the past, it gives people a pretty good indication as to what they can expect from you in the future. And I don't want to beat up on your opponents uh, because I, I have too much fun doing that at other times on the show. But there seems to be a great deal of inconsistency. And then that leads itself to, well, that's what you're telling us now, but that's not what you said then. So how do I have any trust that that's what you're going to do in the future? Yeah, I think this is a consequence that uh, being in office is more important to them than trying to reveal the truth or try to solve the problems. Because when I first started, the last thing I expected was a political career and didn't expect much because I was going to be rather blunt on what I thought we had to do. But even early on, even in the 70s, people welcomed that, that attitude. And, and, you, and you follow me enough to know how I voted. Sometimes the vote seemed to be not in the interest of my particular district. But it came to, it came around to the people in the district knew and understood it. It was ultimately in their best interest. And I think that's what's happening now because uh, people have lost trust in government. They've, they've been told so many lies and stories. Right. And even people on the receiving end are getting a little bit worried. That, Boy, I'm not even going to get it. The people have been paying for it. They're just sick and tired of being, of, of being forced to pay for all these programs. And and the bluntness, I, uh, I I'd like to pick up on that a little bit, Congressman. I think to some people might be a little off-putting because in this world of massaged answers and do no harm and I don't want to offend, that we get this double speak, this political speak, and we never actually get around to do these jeans make my butt look big? No, your butt makes the jeans look big. And when you say that, it's blunt, but it's true. And I do think people in a certain way. Uh, appreciate the bluntness and the honesty. Well, it probably that's probably the reason that I'm, I'm not a fan of political correctness because it drives me nuts at times. People, even though political correctness isn't a law, a lot of people suffer from it. So there are unwritten laws, and people suffer a whole lot. They're, they're just not allowed to be frank, and, uh, and and language becomes such a detriment to some people. I was looking at uh, you know the poll response I have about looking towards 2012, and I was asking people, how do you see things next year? How do you see things unfolding for you and yours? 25% of the people say it's going to get better. 49% say it's going to get worse. 26% say same as it ever was. How does thing? How do things in America change with a Ron Paul presidency? What happens? How soon does it happen? What needs to happen? Well, it uh, it depends on how much you can accomplish and how fast. And one person ha in, a, in the presidency is very, very important, but that in itself won't work unless the people know what you're doing. Uh, but if I'm to be elected president, it means that new members will come into the Congress and people will look and say, hey, how did he win? This is what the people are thinking about. So all of a sudden they change their attitude so you can accomplish a little bit more. But it, it, it can't be done overnight. If if we would have not done the things that we have done for the last four years to slow up the correction and uh, clean the slate, uh, it could be done in a year, uh, like it has been in the past. But when governments get involved in trying to change all these things and to prop bad debt up, it prolongs the agony. 
But if you did the right things, usually it would take about a year or so to uh, get back on our feet again. But at the rate we're going, at the rate we're going, it's going to get a lot worse. I'm in that 49 percent that thinks things will be worse next year uh, unless we change things. If we change things, I think that uh, for a year we'd still have some trouble. But we would uh, really get back on our feet rather quickly after that. Is there, by the way, Congressman Ron Paul is with us. Ron Paul 2012.com is the website. Um, is there a point of no return? I know you talk about debts and deficits and how do we avoid generational bankruptcy and the trillions of dollars that are unaccounted for and the Fed's role in this and the Treasury and the kind of the uh, the repeating of the status quo. Is there a point of uh, return where we're going to start to see ourselves uh, in the situation of Greece or Italy? And I say that from a perspective, Congressman, of we've seen two democratically elected presidencies be replaced by technocrats to protect what I call the bankster gangster crime scene. Would something like that ever get to the point of happening here where we would see technocrats be installed as opposed to the voice of the people installing the people that they think should be leading the nation? Well, my sense of optimism that we can correct things in a year really accepts the fact that we are at the point of no return in some areas financially. The debt isn't going to be paid down. All of a sudden, we can't we can't have uh, enough money to pay the obligations of the entitlement system, $60, $70 trillion. We can't deal with the $3 trillion debt we owe foreigners and the $15 trillion we owe ourselves and our national debt. But the debt, the debt has to be liquidated. And where we, uh, so we're at a point of no return there that it has to be paid down. It's how we're going to do it. And are we going to do it calmly and deliberately and cut back and make the pain much less than it has to be? What, where we have a chance is how, how we do this so that we can avoid a political collapse. Because if we continue to do what we're doing, now that the civil liberties of this country are being so much undermined and anybody can be accused of almost anything, uh, that is my greatest fear, is that uh, we, if we don't change that, uh, but we still are at a point where we can change things. We're not at the point of no return in, in saving our political system, protecting our liberties, but we have to admit that we are bankrupt and we have to deal with it. If an individual got to that point, they can't just keep spending and think that it's going to work out. And some people get at the point of no return, and they have to, uh, you, know, you know, either uh, go into bankruptcy or get more jobs or quit spending. They have to uh, change their lifestyle. So far, there's not much indication in Washington they're willing to change our political lifestyle, and yet the people I'm meeting right now on the campaign trail, a lot of people are waking up and they're realizing that we as a nation have to change our lifestyle. Congressman Ron Paul with us. RonPaul2012.com is the website. Congressman, when, when Ronald Reagan said to Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, it wasn't just Ronald Reagan. I think Gorbachev interpreted that as the voice, uh, the will, and, and the might of the American people that were behind the words of President Reagan. And I think what we need now when it comes to what you talk about, we need to cut $4 trillion. We need to get serious about our money. We need to, we need to, we need to. The more people you have behind you, the more the voice and the power and the will of the people puts more power and oomph behind whatever it is you or whoever it is who ends up being the president of the United States. So that when you tell members of Congress, we got to do this now, it's not just you saying it, it's the country saying it. Absolutely. And if people don't understand that, their expectations will be overly high. But governments generally uh, reflect the will of the people and their understanding. But if it's met with total resistance and they don't understand what we're doing and why we change foreign policy and why we have to curtail the Fed's power to create money, uh, it doesn't work. So prevailing attitudes are key, and that's through education. And, and you participate on a daily basis because you're on a show like this, and it does help to change people's attitude. That's where I think we're making progress. That's where when I see the college kids and going to college campuses, I get really excited about these attitudes are changing, and therefore I have hope that uh, we can turn this around. Uh, but up for the last 50, 60 years, the attitude was, the government can solve all our problems, that we have to be the policemen of the world. You print money when you need it, and deficits don't matter. Those conservatives and liberals yeah, preach that gospel, deficits don't matter. But we have to right. come around to the point where deficits do matter and do something about it. 
I know you're busy. Last question for you, Congressman. I know the campaign trail is grueling, uh, event after event, phone calls to shows like this. Um, uh, do you ever get any Ron Paul time? And, and, and is there ever a moment where you kind of go, uh, Ron Paul thinks this, Ron Paul likes this show, Ron Paul wants a cheeseburger. Is there ever just a Ron Paul moment where you get to be Ron Paul? Oh, yeah, when I get home, and right now I'm looking forward. We have a couple more events tonight, and I've been I've had four very, very busy days up in New Hampshire and now in, in Iowa. And, of course, the uh, energy comes because uh, we're getting big crowds out, and they're enthusiastic. But I'm heading home, and I'll get home tonight at midnight or so, and I'm going to have a couple days off for the weekend, and I'm looking forward to it. Then I get to ride my bike and a few things like that that some people might think it's silly, but it's very important to me. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think uh, obviously, a very important election coming up. And I am proud that you have given me the opportunity to get behind a man like you who shows that a consistent constitutionalist, a consistent conservative, is the best choice to beat a consistent socialist, that being Barack Obama. Congressman Ron Paul, Merry Christmas to you. Happy New Year. Happy holidays. And uh, continued success to you out there on the campaign trail. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon. Yes, sir. 800-876-4123 is the number. Any Ron Paul time? Can you, I mean, having run for office and been the Republican nominee for Congress in California, you, you, you turn into like Soundbite Steve. And then you get home at the end of the day and you're looking in the mirror and you go, what does Jerry think? Is Jerry ready for bed? What does Jerry want to have to eat before Jerry goes to bed? <laughs> then you go, what time does Jerry have to get up from bed tomorrow to do the next Jerry event where they want to know what Jerry thinks? And I'm like, enough of me. We'll hear from you. Give us a call. Stick with me. Jerry Doyle.